Welcome, and thanks for viewing our weekly sermon. My name is Malone. I'm one of the pastors here at West Acres. We pray that this message blesses you and helps you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about West Acres or connect with us, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. Well, thank the Lord, and thank Rob and James and our musicians for leading us in worship today. I don't know if I could have... Uh, planned the songs that were sung today uh, that meant more to me than what these have meant to me for such a time as this, uh, time to come together and worship and praise the Lord. We, we hear a lot of news, the discouraging news that's going on, uh, even within our church family and those that are hurting and going through tough times. And God's word always gives us hope and strength for today and tomorrow. Amen. Thank you for being here, and I, I'd like to just take just a moment to, would you mind if I share just a couple of things of good news for you? <laughs> Not that we don't hear good news here, because we've been singing about it, and we're going to hear about it in God's Word, and we heard about it even in our prayer request, and even though that some of our folks are hurting, and especially the Poston family, all of those, all of those families, but especially something so just out of the the blue to happen uh, to Kim on Friday uh, just uh, breaks our heart and, and we hurt for this family in a dear way, especially Van and also some of you may not remember this, but this Kim Poston is Jonathan Powell who was a member here, uh, It's his was his mother. Uh, so please be remembering uh, this family as they go through a difficult time. But I wanna share a couple of things of good news before we open up God's good news. And, and see what he has for us today. Um, as I was walking in, Teresa Lee was able to share with me about her daughter-in-law who has been battling cancer, and uh, they just recently found out that she is cancer-free. And so we are thankful to hear that good news. It's always great to hear that. Another thing that I wanna share with you is uh, something from one of our own here at West Acres. It's uh, States Fort. Uh, States Fort uh, this past week was named the Sunbelt Conference Men's Golfer of the Week at Coastal Carolina. And that is uh, some great news as well. As we keep up with States, he's a fifth year senior uh, at Coastal due to COVID, uh, all that's happened there. But uh, we celebrate what God is doing through him. And the great thing about States is he's getting some uh, great accolades of, of uh, great accomplishments, but he does it all in the name of the Lord. Uh, he, he's a witness and a testimony to those guys around him and those that he uh, uh, plays golf with and against. And uh, that is a great blessing, and we thank the Lord for that. Uh, so congratulations, Mom and Dad. <laughs> well, today we're going to continue uh, our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, I, I never know. I had originally planned that, um, and I said I had originally planned, uh, remember and hold on to the word I, uh, I had planned about four messages that we would be looking at in 1 Corinthians 13. And I had started looking to cover at least two to three more verses uh, today, but we're going to cover four words <laughs> instead of four verses. I tried, uh, but I couldn't get beyond uh, these few verses with where we are, where we live, what we're experiencing, and what we're going through. Uh, God has reassured me uh, through this study uh, that his word right now for me in 1 Corinthians 13 is the word for the moment, is the word for the day, is the word for where we are in our life in this world we live. And so therefore, it motivates me, encourages me even more uh, to be able to stand where I am, to be able to know that what I'm getting ready to share with you, with you is from the Lord. And it's for you. There's a lot of hurting people in our church family, as you already know. Uh, but God's love comes alone to sustain us and encourage us because he's a God of long suffering and he's a God of kindness. And we're going to be able to see that through uh, his word here today. So if you can, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, uh, but I'm going to read through verse 4a, verse 4a, just the first part, which that's where our main text will come from this morning in our study. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, title of the message is Living a Life of Love. 
living a life of love in our series, The Unrelenting Love of God. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And then the first part of verse 4 will be our text today. Love suffers long and is kind. Love suffers long and is kind. Father, thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for us being able to experience that even here today. Thank you for the beautiful song service that you allowed us, Lord, to prepare our hearts uh, and worship to open your word and study. Thank you for giving those very songs uh, to Rob and for him sharing those with us today from you to prepare us for the here and now as we have read your word and now as we begin to study it. Father, maybe we not take this time for granted, but may it be a time that we're, Lord, that it's like the first time that we've been able to come to your house and the first time even to hear your word that we'll be so eagerly awaiting on the edge of our seat, desiring to hear what you have for us today because we know your word never returns void and it's what we need for such a time as this. Lord, we're hungry and we're eager and we have hearts that have great desire this morning to be moved by you to hear your word. So hide me behind your cross, speak your words to me and through me, and may what comes out of my mouth fall on hearts and lives in this room and those that watch by live stream that we will never be the same again, that we'll never look at life the same again, we'll not look at people the same again. Father, that you will help us to see people as you see people, and you'll help us to love and be long-suffering with people the way you are to us. Thank you, and we give you all the praise, Father. Please help me today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. In the first three verses of this chapter, we're taught and instructed that life without love we learned last week is empty and it's meaningless and I hope you've had time to think about that even more and pray over it even more because whenever we think about life being meaningless and worthless uh, that's pretty discouraging and depressing and what I mean by that is if we're living this life and we're thinking we're living it the way God would have us to do without love it's a life of, of Nothing. It's, it's, it really is meaningless. It, it doesn't move us and encourage us, and it really doesn't move others and encourage them. But we're going to be able to see here in God's Word. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you remember that last verse of Scripture in verse 31, he says, I show you a more excellent way to live your life. Paul comes along and he says, I, I want to show you from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, there's a more excellent way for you to live your life. And I believe that he's teaching us that even here today. And he goes on to tell us that that more excellent way is found here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the way of love. It's living a life of love that makes a difference in a cruel, hard, dark discouraging world that that is filled with hate uh, and it's filled with hate with many many people but God is showing us here today in his word how we're to live as followers of him remember and don't forget ever but especially remind, be reminded this morning the word love that we're talking about here in this chapter is a very powerful love it's not your ordinary everyday love it's not the love that many times we use in our uh, vernacular or our vocabulary in the world we live today uh, but this is a love the Bible tells us is a agape love an agape love it's a godly love and can only be received uh, through a relationship with God um, you, you can't manufacture this kind of love you can't hope for this kind of love uh, it only comes from God Almighty because he is the founder and producer and the inventor and the giver of this kind of love. And it's the agape love. 
You remember this love is a love without condition, and that's why this love is different than most of the love that we use and the terminology we use in the world today, because a lot of times when we refer to love, our love is dependent on what we might receive or gain from loving others. And this is the kind of love is a love that is without condition. It is also a love that is a selfless love. And most of all, what makes it so important, it is a love that is a supernatural love. As I said, we can't manufacture it. It comes from God and God alone. So we're able to celebrate this love. It's a love we hear about in the church most often, but it's a word we hear about in the church so many times that we overlook the importance of it and the power of it and how it's to be lived out in each and every one of our lives. It's interesting whenever you study the qualities that this love possesses that Jesus Christ has all of these character qualities and he even to this day and time continues to live out those qualities within his life in you and through you. It wasn't something that was just for back then, not something just to let people know what love was like back then and how to live. He allows it to continue to be manufactured and be able to experience and be lived out in our life, even here today, even this morning. Uh, these words are not just for, for our information. And please understand this. Some people sit in the pew or listen to God's word and, and our intent, our heart, our motivation is to get as much information as we can get. We feel like the more information we can get, the better off we're going to be. This is not what we're talking about here today. These words are not just for information. These words are not just for inspiration. These words are not just for instruction. These words are for motivation. These words are words that the Word of God says will bring, bring transformation, which leads only then leads to a lifestyle of love. Lifestyle of love. If there's one thing that ever were to happen within my life and my ministry here at West Acres that I would love to hear more than anything when the day would come that I'm no longer here at West Acres or, or maybe if you leave and go somewhere else that you would be able to say one thing for sure about West Acres, it was a church of love. If you want to draw people and lead people into a relationship with the Lord God, the way you do that is not great programs. Those are great and wonderful. It's not having the best of the best. It's not having the most wonderful facilities. It's about people loving people. It's about people that have been loved by God, being loved by God, and they understand that love is an agape love, an unconditional love, and then we can't help but allow that love to pour over into the hearts and lives of people we know and people that walk through the doors for the first time, for people that we see in the grocery store, at the gas pumps, wherever it may be, that they're able to see that there's something different about that person, and it's because they got it one day to understood what the love of God really means and the impact and the power of the love of God within our hearts and our lives. The Bible says this, that love is long-suffering, which means this. It's just another word for love is patient. Love is patient. Also, it says in verse 4 that this love that we're talking about is a love of kindness. Love is kind, the Bible says. Don't miss this, patience and kindness are twins. Love, and patience and kindness are all on the same side of the coin. You can't separate the two of them whatsoever. So this morning, there are two things that I want you to notice today from God's word. Just two things this morning, but they are loaded. And, and, and I pray loaded with inspiration and encouragement and motivation, most of all, for us to understand that the only way we can be transformed into the likeness of Christ is to be surrendered to his love and allowing his love to be lived out in our lives. I always, even though I don't know everyone in this church and I don't know every single name like maybe I used two years ago, there's something about when you get older uh, and you put glasses on and and you have a little hearing aid some I don't have that yet, but that's probably coming uh, There's something about whenever you grow older. It's harder to remember names There was a day at West Acres when even we were much larger than we are now. I, I believe I don't I probably w Would not be a 100% but 99% of the people that 
walk through the doors of this church and sit in the pews of this church, I knew their name. And, and I, I can't do that. I know a lot of names, but not like I'd like to know. But I do tell you this, that I love you as a church. Uh, I, I love you whether I know your name or I don't know your name or if we just meet in the hallway for the first time today. And I see some as I just continue to look at it and know there, there's hurt and there's, there's heartache in their families through things that have happened. And whenever there's a love of God in the, in the heart of people, uh, it's important that we hurt with other people. That's a part of love. Whenever, whenever, whenever I hurt and whenever I go through difficulties in my life, my Lord, the Lord Jesus, he hurts. And, and I know he wept over Lazarus, but I think he weeps sometimes over me and, and over you and our hurt and our pain that we go through because he knows all about it. And that's the kind of love that God has given to us, and he wants it to be demonstrated within our lives. Let me take you to the first point here this morning. And it's an important one, and it's a very hard one. It's a challenging one. The first point today is patience is a challenge. I didn't know any other way to put it, but patience is a challenge in our lives. Patience and long-suffering are found in God's Word throughout His Word. Long-suffering again, and I know I repeat myself from time to time, but it must be important that I do, but long-suffering again means patience. When you find the word patience, it has to do with dealing with our circumstances, with dealing with circumstances in our lives, being patient with difficulties, being patient when difficult times come, being patient when adversities come in your life. But when Scripture, notice this, when Scripture says long-suffering, it's talking about our patience here with dealing with people. It talk, talks about dealing with people most of the time whenever we discourage, bring discouragement on God's name or, or, or bring discouragement uh, with, with other people within our circle, maybe our life, our family, our church. When we go through the most difficult times, many times it's because we've had a lack of patience. And the Bible talks so much about that. It's so hard to have the kind of patience that will build people up instead of destroying people and bringing discouragement in their lives. He's talking about patience with dealing with people. See, love is long-suffering, which means we are long-suffering and patient with people. That has to be a priority with our family, and that has to be a priority within our church, and that has to be a priority in the community we live in. Long-suffering means slowness to act it means slowness to act it means being long tempered which means to be short tempered it means that we we have that under control because of the love of God is evident in our lives we don't make and boy this was one we don't make impulsive decisions we 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 give time on our knees in God's Word with decisions that are difficult and hard to make. We don't just make impulsive decisions. We don't rush to a hasty judgment in people's lives when we hear what they have going on or what they've done or maybe what they're not doing that we think they should do. And we are not to go to them or to have hasty judgment upon them. The Bible says long-suffering causes us to act more cautiously. And I believe within the church and the family of God, that is a great word for us to think about here today, that we need to leave here today with a different perspective. And, and that different perspective be this, that we are going to be a people that act more cautiously with other people. It refuses to give way to anger. It refuses to give, give way to anger within our lives. The kind of long-suffering, this kind of long-suffering is patiently silent. It's patiently silent. It's not argumentative. It's not picking a fight. 
It's not trying to put someone down or to discourage someone. That's not what he's talking about here. People may wrong us. People may nag us. People may criticize us. People may annoy us. But the Bible says this, that love is patient. You know, one thing I have found over many years is you can't escape people. Even if you try to escape people, you cannot escape people. People, they are everywhere. You have to practice long-suffering everywhere. Not just in my family, not just in my church family. It has to be practiced everywhere we go. You have to practice it in the grocery store. You better go into the grocery store thinking about the loving kindness of God. And I'm to demonstrate that because someone is going to do something to, to get a little fire going inside of you. And if you don't remember these words, your patience are going to grow so thin, you're going to allow anger to come out. And then when you get into the car, you're going to be wondering what just happened. Well, you see that at the grocery store. You see that at the gas pumps. You see that even at church. And you see it even at home. That you have to demonstrate long-suffering and patience. Uh, You cannot drive down the road without being tested. I believe without a doubt that's God's number one test that he's given his people. I know we don't live in Atlanta. I hear and I've driven in Atlanta a little bit. And if I don't ever have to drive in Atlanta again, it'll be a praise the Lord that I won't have to do that. But I'm telling you what, here many times it's crazy. And it's one of the things for me that, that, that I have to work with because, because I'm, I'm, wanting, I'm wanting to blow my horn and it's all I can do. And I'm, I've gotten here lately where I've started blowing my horn and, 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 and that's not a good thing to do, I know. And, and I think about I've got to be patient. Why are they not going? I see them on their cell phone or I see them putting makeup on in the mirror. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, God, what are you doing? Why are you allowing me to go through this? And what he's doing, he's testing my patience. He's testing to see if I'm going to be kind or not. Every day you have to deal with people. Don't you all deal with people at school? Are there some people that just kind of irritate you? That you're thinking, oh no, maybe home school is much better than being here. I don't have to be around them and with them. Uh, There's all, everywhere you go, there is people. And the Bible says we have to be slow tempered. Now I'm going to tell you, if God tells you to be slow tempered, you can be slow tempered. If he tells you to be slow-tempered and long-suffering, you can be that way. We, we have to control our mouth. We have to control our, we have to be long-suffering, a husband to a wife. I have to be long-suffering to my wife, and my wife will tell you she has to be long-suffering to me. We have to be patient with one another. Last night or a couple of nights ago, um, I was having some stomach problems, some things going on there. Not, not anything that, that would, would, would turn, that would make you feel bad here today. But I, just, some, some, just some things there, and, and it was hard to sleep. And, and, and I, my wife, Kay, she said, you know, Dr. Oliver said, if you lay on your left side, that'll help you. Well, every time I have a little stomach problem, I hear that every single time. And she told me again, I said, don't tell me that again. I know that. And then I thought, Oh my, I wasn't long suffering. I wasn't being kind. That was a little something. But if we're not careful, even in our home with our husband and our wives, it can get out of control. And we have to work on it daily. As I said, everywhere you go, there are people. Our long suffering, a husband to a wife, children to parents. Employee to employer, friends to friend, people in church, people everywhere. We have to extend long suffering. So how do we do it? How does it work? Paul did it. 
And he is a great example for us. Paul was a man who had to deal with adverse circumstances and he dealt with many difficult people. And I want to take you to 2 Corinthians 6, 4 and just read just a few verses here. Paul is sharing here, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in, he says, much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting, and then he says, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. So how does he do it? He tells us by the Holy Spirit, by a sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God. You see, whenever Paul was in jail, he had pastors trying to steal his church. He had people trying to steal his church, destroy his church. He dealt with all kinds of difficult people. He practiced long suffering by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we got saved, if you're a believer, when you got saved, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. All the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. So the reason you turn from sin to Christ is all because of the long-suffering of God. In Genesis 6, God looked down upon the world and he said this, Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, what a mess. The people, look at them, the people are so bad. I'm going to wash the entire human race into eternity, into hell, because of the mess this world is in. He tells them, he says, judgment is coming. He said, my spirit will not always strive with men, yet I'm going to give another 120 years. You see, the long suffering of God... I'm getting ready to speak about something here just for a moment that's a little controversial. And I warn you that I'm getting ready to speak of something a little controversial because some people only come to church and some only tune in hoping to hear something controversial. So, wives, nudge your husband and say he's getting ready to speak something controversial. And then they'll wake up and they'll tune in and they'll begin to listen to the message here today. Now... Don't amen what I'm going to say. Because if you say amen whenever I say what I'm going to say, you've used amen in the wrong context and in the wrong place. And if you do, I'm going to point you out. So don't say amen until we just get it all out. Some people ask this question, and it's probably one of the most popular questions we hear asked in the church to ministers in the world today. Why hasn't the judgment of God fallen on America? Why hasn't the judgment of God fallen on America? Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what took place there. We're much worse than what they are. We've gone beyond what they did, how they lived, their rebellion and, and, and this association with God Almighty. Why? Hasn't the judgment of God fallen on America? They point to all the sin and all the rebellion and all the places the law of God has been violated. I want to tell you why. There's a clear answer why. There's a clear reason today that that He hasn't done to us what He did to Sodom and Gomorrah and other people. Here it is. Between the cross, between the cross and the rapture, is an age that we call the age of grace. Now that's a good place for an amen. Amen. The age of grace. Between the cross and and the rapture, there's an age of grace. It's the ministry of grace. In 2 Peter 3, Peter says to those that mock the truth of the coming of Christ, they said this, why hasn't Jesus come? They even were telling Paul during that time, you said he's coming. Where is he? Why hasn't Jesus come? You said he would be here. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. Don't miss this verse. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. He says he's coming. It says here, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. Is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. And here we go. But that all should come to repentance. This is a picture for me to know that God is not coming yet. He's not laying the hammer down on America yet because He still has people that He's waiting and willing and desiring and desiring to use the church to lead to come to a place of repentance in their lives. You see, the mystery in the Old Testament was the age of grace. You can study about the age of grace in the Old Testament and no one really understood it. Though no one really could make sense out of it. And then Paul comes along and in the New Testament, he removes the mystery and shares with us what this age of grace is all about. What it means in our lives. See, during the age of grace, souls are going to be saved. Souls are going to be saved. Mercy is going to be offered. People are going to be born again. People are going to have lives changed in, during this age of grace. Listen to me, church. God hasn't called us to call fire down on the lost and the wicked around us. He's called us to share the gospel in this First Corinthian love. He's called us to share it with our lifestyle. He's called us to share it with the way we live and the way we talk to people by being long-suffering and by being patient with people. There's not a sinner so mean, so wicked, so messed up, so vile in all of the CSRA or in this nation if they will turn to Christ in faith, the unseen hand of God. It's a promise because of His Word that He's going to reach down and He will give them eternal life. What's holding everything back? God's long suffering. That's what's holding it all back. God's long suffering. I'm so glad. I'm I'm more than so glad that God had long suffering with me because I didn't get saved the first time he was leading me to be saved. He did not give up on me. He, he kept on because of the age of grace. He didn't give me one chance to get it right. He gave me several opportunities that, that I would surrender more and more and more to the Holy Spirit of God. And then one day, there was this surrender to God and giving my heart and life to Him. Long suffering and patience is a challenge. You ever had trouble with being patient with me over the years? It's okay, because there's some of you I've had trouble being patient with you as well. But that's life. I have trouble being patient with my wife sometimes. She has trouble being patient with me sometimes. I have trouble being patient with my boys sometimes. And my boys, I'm sure, would tell you they have trouble being patient with me sometimes. Patience is a challenge. Let me take you to number two. I like this point a lot better than the first one. (laughs) Kindness is a choice. Kindness is a choice. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 again says, Love suffers long and is kind. The word kind is defined this way. It is active goodness on behalf of others. Kindness is active goodness on behalf of other people. Active service towards someone else. Not only feeling generous, but being generous to other people. You hear people many times, they feel sorry for someone with what they're going through or the pain they're experiencing or not being able to pay their bills or, or maybe they're just lonely and we've, we feel sorry for them, but we never ever 
go anywhere else. We don't go further with that by going to be generous to them, to be able to help them and encourage them, to be kind to them, generous and loving without any strings attached, totally without condition. See, God is the greatest teacher in the Word. Of course He is. He's the greatest teacher of kindness. Romans 2 verse 4 says this, Again, or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God, the kindness of God, leads to repentance. It leads to repentance. See, God didn't have the attitude of giving you payback for your sins. He, he did not say, I'm going to pay you back for your sinfulness in your life. The Bible says he treats us with loving kindness. Now, what I want to do here this morning is give you just several pictures of where kindness of God is displayed throughout the scripture. I'm just going to give you two uh, uh, situations or illustrations, and there are many, many more. Some people get away from the Lord, don't they? You may have done that. You may even be there today. Some people get away from the Lord. In the book of Revelation, the Bible even says that some lost their first love. That even some that knew him, some that lived for him, some that had surrendered to him. He said there are some of those, even some of those, they lost their first love. It says in another place that not in speaking to Christians as well, he's speaking, he says, and even some people are lukewarm. Some people are lukewarm. They're neither hot, they're neither cold, but they are lukewarm. And he says that that causes me to want to spew them out of my mouth. I want you to think about with me for a moment, Peter. Peter was saved, but he betrayed the Lord three times. So he knows about knowing the Lord, walking with the Lord, and turning his back on the Lord. He experienced all that in his life. And even Peter said these words, Lord, I will defend you with my life. Lord, I will lay my life down for you. I promise you it is a done deal. Oh, whenever I hear that and see that and study in the scripture, I'm reminded again just how kind Jesus is. Because after Christ was raised from the dead, Jesus encountered Peter. And Jesus said this, after Peter had denied him three times, three times. Not he didn't just deny him and say, no, I don't know him. He even to the third time even started cursing. He used curse words to be able to make his point even more. Putting a big exclamation point on the fact that I do not even know him. When Christ was raised from the dead, Jesus encountered Peter, great experience in the word of God. Jesus said to him, do you love me? He said, do you love me? He asked him three times and Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Three times he denied the Lord. Three times Jesus kindly gives him the privilege to say what he should have said at the very beginning. Lord, you know I love you. So I say to you here this morning, and it's a reminder to me, if you've gotten away from Christ, if you've cooled off, if you've backed down, if you've even denied the Lord, Jesus Christ waits with his open arms to restore you and to wrap his open arms around you and to remind you of this agape love that you've read about and studied about, but he wants you to experience it in your life. Later, later, we see the apostle Peter preaching and 3,000 people got saved. And it was all because not of the preaching style, not even what Peter was preaching. But it was all because of the kindness of God. Because of the kindness of Jesus Christ in his life. Another illustration we see in the word of God. Love is kind when it comes to salvation. Can I tell you, this is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. You've been here long enough, you've heard me say that. If you've been here long enough, you've heard me say that about many different ones in the Bible. But this is one of my favorite stories in the entire Word of God and how it speaks to us today. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, we meet an unusual boy. We meet a very, very unusual boy. He's five years old whenever we meet him. 
five years old when we read about him. He had an unusual name. I know of no one in my over 60 years of life now, I know of no one naming their child this. No one. You know, people name their children, many people do, out biblical names. We did. We named two Old Testament, one New Testament. We had a Caleb and a Jacob and a Luke. Old Testament, New Testament. I've never seen anyone name their child Mephibosheth. Because <laughs> I've got to be careful even whenever I'm talking about him because what might come out, it may sound like whenever I'm saying that. I've said it a few times and it's like I've cursed a few times. So if you hear me curse today, it's not me cursing. It's just that my mouth's having trouble saying the word, the name, Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, it says that King Saul, who was the father of Jonathan, had a grandson, Jonathan's son, and his name was Mephibosheth. And when King Saul and Jonathan were killed, they were both killed at the battle of Gilboa. Both were. And when the king during that time would die, it was interesting, they, they would try to eliminate the family so there would be no issue of succession. No su issue of succession with family members taking the throne. And the Bible says when they died in battle, the nurse, the nurse, even back in the Old Testament, showing you how special nurses are. The nurse of Mephibosheth took care of him, seeking to take him and hide him because they were going to come and get him and more than likely kill him. But something happened along the way. Somehow, the nurse dropped Mephibosheth. Dropped him as she was carrying him to get him away to a hiding place. And whenever he fell, it injured his feet. Not foot, but injured his feet. And the Bible says this. It's interesting how many times it says this. That he was lame in both feet. They don't always give his name. They'll talk about the son of Jonathan who was lame in both feet. From that time on, you would see that over and over. That's how he was referred to. So years pass. We'll skip forward a little bit here. David ascends to the throne. Saul, the grandfather of Mephibosheth, if you remember, if you remember, Jonathan loved David. There was a great love relationship between Jonathan and David, but Saul hated David. Saul hated David, and, and really Saul had tried in many ways, in many occasions, to kill this man, David. And now David, the shepherd boy, is on his throne. And this is amazing to me. Oh, not that God, God's word's amazing, but it, it's made possible because of who we're talking about and what he wants us to see. But one day, David, one day David calls in one of Saul's servants. His name was Ziba, Z-I-B-A. And he said, Ziba, I want to ask you something. Is there any relative there that's left in the house of Saul that I might show them the kindness of God? Is there anybody left in the household of Saul that I can show them the kindness of God? And Ziba did not have to take much time at all. And he said, actually, there is. Saul's grandson, he's still alive. And David, his name is Mephibosheth. And David said this, go get him. Go get him and bring him to me. Now, can you imagine as they're going and can you imagine as Mephibosheth is in this place, as he's been there for years now, he hasn't had a knock on his door like this ever since his father and grandfather died, but here they come, they knock on his door. Can you imagine what that must have been like? They come in and they say, we're coming to you from the king of Israel. We're coming to you from the king of Israel, David, and he wants you, Mephibosheth, to
to come to his throne now. Do I have time to pack? Now. He wants you now. Can you imagine the fear and the terror? I put myself there and not knowing what I know now, not knowing what you know now, I would have been shaking in my boots or in my robe or in my sandals. I would have been shaking. How wouldn't we really know what was going to happen? I would be thinking that death is on the way. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, it says they took Mephibosheth and he comes into the king's presence and he's limping. Can you imagine? He's limping. He's limping both feet from the fall. He's so filled with fear. And the scripture says he falls prostrate. Not just on his knees, but he falls face down prostrate. He falls on his face in the fear before David. And David says these words. And I think that probably David could not get these words out quick enough. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because I want to show you, Mephibosheth, the kindness of God. I want to show you the kindness of God. So David said this, David said this, he says, first of all, all of Saul's inheritance, I'm going to give to you, Mephibosheth, all of it is going to be yours. Secondly, he said, you can live here with me. All the inheritance of Saul, that's great and wonderful. But David, the king of Israel, that's sitting on the throne, says, you can live here with me. And thirdly, he says this. Every time we have a meal, I want you to come sit down in the chair and pull that chair up next to the table because I want you to eat with me. He didn't put him in the quarters of those that were working and were slaves to David or whoever, but he was brought to the king's table. He was welcome to come to the king's table. In 2 Samuel 9, 13, it says, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for, listen to this, he ate continually at the king's table. And here we go, and he was lame in both feet. There's something about that, and it's coming. There's a great reason that we hear so much about, and he was lame in both his feet. To me, church, this is a great picture that God has shown to you and me by saving our souls. We all, we all were like Mephibosheth. Think about it. We were all like Mephibosheth. He was crippled by a fall. He was crippled by a fall. Those twisted feet, those twisted feet were evidence of the fall that he had experienced. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve fell, and we have a sin nature, and it shows we are lost. It shows we are separated from God. There's no greater picture to remind you, to show you that before salvation, before Jesus came, what happened in the garden was a picture that we are lost. And David said to Mephibosheth, you will have the inheritance of your father. We were lost because of the fall. But the day you put your trust, listen, listen. The day you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you became a joint, a joint heir of Jesus Christ. That means you have an inheritance. You've got all the forgiveness. You've got all the power. You've got all the peace. You've got all the love. You've got everything that Christ possesses. That's at your birthright as a believer. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go, Jesus says, listen to me. I go, Jesus says, and I prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. And when I come again, it's not to show off. I'm coming again to receive you. To myself that where I am, there you may be also. Until then, 
Your heart, he says, is going to be my home. Until that day comes, and what's even better, we've got to go to a home that he's prepared for us, but don't get so excited over that home. But to be reminded, he says, my heart, your heart, is his home. And I'll never leave you. Mephibosheth feasted at the king's table with those lame feet. This is what I don't want you to miss, and I'll close here. The meal, the table set. Mephibosheth probably got there a little early. I'm just, I'm just thinking about some things that would happen in Scripture. I don't know this for sure, just like you do sometimes. He probably got there a little early to be seated before the King David came in so that when King David came in that he could stand up on his feeble feet in honor of the king. When he would scoot up to the king's table, now watch this with me just for a moment. Whenever he would scoot up to the king's table, there was a linen tablecloth. He scoots up to the king's table. The linen tablecloth would fall across his waist. And when the tablecloth would fall across his waist, you could not see his twisted feet, which was evident of the fall he experienced. Are you here today? Are you listening today? When you trusted Christ as your Savior, your sins were forgiven. They were washed away. But listen, you received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when God looks at you, He doesn't see your twisted mind. He he doesn't see your twisted will. He doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of His Son given to you by grace through faith. I've never seen that picture before. Of his crippledness, it was covered over by the blood of Jesus, by the forgiveness of sin. All of it because of the kindness of God. The kindness of God. John 8, 36 says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Christ has freed you to love people. Christ has freed you to love them with long-suffering. Christ has freed you to love people with kindness. To love people like Jesus loves you. That's what He desires. That's why He gives us His Word this morning. That we'll leave here with a greater picture, understanding, perspective of God's agape love and how we are to live it out. And I'm telling you this, in my lifetime, there has never been a more important time in my lifetime that the people of God live out the love of God. The very thing that's missing now more than ever is the love of God and God's people so we can transfer the love of God into a hateful, sad, depressing world. Really, it is all about God.